Just waiting for you, Shirley. <laughs> it's quite all right. All right. For those of you who have stuck it out this afternoon, thank you very much. Welcome to the second day of the 2024 American Gem Trade Association Tucson Elevated Seminar Series, sponsored by the American Gem Society. Burger King or Burger Duke? The fascination of crowns, coronets, and tiaras. Anyone who's met Carrie Gregory of Gemology Rocks knows she's a one-woman whirlwind, passionate, funny, motivating. Carrie's presentations are fast-paced, practical, and definitely entertaining. A past editor and head of the ATC for Gemini, Carrie served on the board of GEMA, the Gemological Association of Great Britain, and ran one of the UK branches. Currently, Carrie is on the board of trustees for the Silversmiths and Jewelers Charity and is a key contributor to the National Association of Jewelers Professional Trade Standards Committee, uh, particularly focusing on gemstones, diamonds, and hallmarking practices. Carrie started Gemology Rocks after a career of retail jewelry, estate jewelry, appraisal, pawnbroking, and plenty of hands-on gemology. So, I hope you have all brought your tiaras. I have mine. <laughs> or is it a crown or is it a coronet? That is the question. Well, no worries. Carrie will explain the difference. Please welcome Lady Carrie Gregory. Thank you. Oh, that's a bit noisy. Um, thank you very much for uh, sitting here. I know it's, it's, it's something you probably don't want to do a lot of the time. Like There's all of the sunshine outside and the gemstones to have a look at. And so sitting in a room listening to somebody yap on is probably not the, not the best idea some of the time. So I do appreciate you being here. I do appreciate my fan club at the front there who've all got their tiaras on. Thank you. Um, but the reason why I decided to do this talk um, well, first of all, I am actually a lady. I am Lady Kerry Gregory. Um, and the reason why I'm a lady is because I'm an idiot. Um, and I tend to go over the top about things. Um, and I want to have a Bridgerton birthday party or a Downton birthday party. And um, I wanted to be able to address my invites from Lady Kerry Gregory. And in the UK, you can actually buy a lordship or a ladyship. So that's what I did. I spent $50. Um, and bought myself a ladyship and I bought Miss, the long-suffering Mr Andrew Lawrence a lordship just so that I can, I can write my invitations from Lady Kerry Gregory. My great-great-great-aunt was a lady, lady, Lady Augusta Gregory, but it wasn't a hereditary title so I didn't get it and I always remember as a child being really vexed that I wasn't Lady, uh, lady Kerry and I should have been, so I just bought my own. But the, the reason behind this talk is, I, mean, I love tiaras. I am not an expert by any, any means. And there are certainly people who are far more expert than me on the subject of tiaras. But it is something that I love and that I am passionate about. And I like wearing tiaras. I will regularly put a tiara on just because I'm a bit grumpy. Like, first thing in the morning, if I'm having a bad day, I will just put on a tiara and go to work. Um, but what I found was, is when I was in the US, if I wore a tiara, and I'm terribly sorry because I'm going to butcher people's accent now, um, and it'll be highly offensive, but you're just going to have to get over it. And any time I wear a tiara, someone will come up to me and go, oh my God, I love your crown. And I'll be like, it's not a crown, it's a tiara. Um, and so I wrote this talk simply because of that, because it's like I need to educate people between the difference. Um, but there's also there's a, there's a, a couple of arguments that I, that I want to solve. So this one, the first one, and this is something that has vexed me for years, um, and I will regularly correct people. So I'm going to state my case as to why it is not Burger King. I'm going to explain why it is not Burger King, it's Burger Duke. I am also going to, even though he's not here, prove a point to my father, um, who is even more stubborn than I am, and will never admit when he's wrong. We had an argument about kings and queens crowns, which I was right about, and so I'm going to argue that case here as well. And then I'm also just a little bit of fun at the end, is like how, how to wear a tiara and some rules and things like that that you can break entirely about wearing tiaras. So this, this has been a long running. I have um, tweeted 
Burger King. I have emailed Burger King. Um, I've done lots and lots of work to try and get them to to change their their, their title. But you can see, so in 2000, it's even my friends have even got in on the act now. So this is my friend Liz and her husband Mark, who who also every time they go to Burger King, they they argue that it, it shouldn't be Burger King. Um, that one back in 2013. But it's definitely longer than that that I've been arguing about this. But lots of other people have similar similar comments about Burger King, Burger Duke, etc. But, so my, my argument about it is, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through some of the definitions of bejeweled headwear. And some of them are quite confusing because some of the words get misused or used in, in slightly different contexts in, in modern language. But also there is a lot of overlap in a lot of the stuff. So there's some stuff that is definitely this thing. And then there's other stuff where you can use the same words in a number of different ways. So the first one is a tiara. And just the, the definition of tiara is simply a bejeweled head ornament. Um, so you might have a hair ornament that would generally be smaller. So tiara generally will encircle the head somehow. It can encircle, it can be an entire circle or it can be an open backed thing. But it essentially it will encircle the head in some way. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't infer any status or it doesn't have any symbolism over that. Anyone can wear a tiara. You don't need to be a particular person or of a particular status to wear a tiara. So it doesn't, it just, it just shows that you're, you're a fancy pants person and you've got enough money to afford a tiara. And the only one that does infer status is the Pope's tiara. And this is again where we get things that are really confusing because that is um, something that's made of three crowns and a diadem and it then becomes a tiara. But it's a, it's a completely different thing and it doesn't look anything like um, the tiaras that we have in common uses. And that one obviously does have some symbolism and does show power. So then the next one, that picture shouldn't be there. Um, I added that this morning and it's supposed to be on the next slide and I forgot to delete it off that one. So just ignore the, the blue thing that's right in the middle of that because that's not supposed to be there. Um, sorry about that. Um, obviously what I do is um, any time I do a presentation, I have to just like panic about it for a few hours in the first morning before I do it and then just mess around with it and change things. Um, and normally what I should do is, is change them so I don't mess it up, but I have done that there. But a diadem does... Um, infer some sort of status or power. Traditionally, diadems were given to show power, to show um, status. The word diadem comes from Greek meaning to bind. And originally it would have been ribbons and that sort of thing. And so usually diadems would be an, a, a complete circle because it was something that was bound around your head to show that you had status and power. So the one on the screen is one that's in the in the Louvre which is quite an old one that's around about 250 BC um, but then we do have modern ones but this is one of those words that does get misused a lot in my opinion. So you've got that one which is where the picture should be on the, the left um, and that one is um, uh, it's the Mary Louise of Austria's diadem which is now in the Smithsonian Museum and that one is a, a complete circle you can't see that from from the picture but it is an entire circle so like this encircling but also it was for an empress and so it shows status it shows power the one on the right in my opinion absolutely is not a diadem that one is the Ravenclaw diadem from Harry Potter and so two reasons why I don't think that that is a diadem is it, it doesn't entirely encircle it is open at the back and it doesn't infer any status or power so in my opinion calling that a diadem is completely wrong that one should just be a tiara but diadems are types of tiaras they just have specific things then the next one is crown, and this does have very specific symbolisms and meanings. So for, a crown is very specifically for royalty and for monarchs. Uh, so they, they are something that infers status, power, and they're also symbols, and particularly in the UK, the crown and the crown jewels are symbols of the, of the sovereign. So they are symbols of the king or the queen, and they have very, very... Um, definite meanings and importance. So the only person who can wear a crown, and this is not just in the UK, in most European countries or most countries where they have royalty, that's what the crown is for and that's what the crown shows. So no one else is going to be wearing a crown except the king or the queen. A coronet, um, though, is, is something slightly different. And this is an example of something that is both a crown and a coronet, really. Uh, this is the Prince of Wales coronet. Uh, and the difference is, is it has arches. So, so if something has arches, that makes it a crown. If it doesn't have arches, it's, it's a coronet. I'm going to talk about coronets a little bit more. 
But this is one of my favourite pieces in the Crown Jewels here. This was made in 1967, I think. I'm just going to refer to my notes so I don't talk rubbish at you. Um, for 1969, sorry, for the Prince of Wales for his investiture at Carnarvon in Wales. And there is, it's just chock-a-block full of symbolism, this. And I just quite like it because it's quite a modern piece as well. So it's one of the more modern pieces in the Crown Jewels. A lot of the pieces go back to sort of like the 14th century. But this is made with Welsh gold. It's got a lot of Welsh symbols in there. Um, and it's just, it's just a really, really beautiful piece. So if you ever do get to go to London, I would, I would recommend going to the Crown Jewels because the Crown Jewels are on display. You can go and see them. And um, the people who are there in, in the room, um, people ask them constantly, are they the real ones? And I said to them, how, how many times a day does someone ask you, are these the real ones? Uh, but they are. They are the genuine crown jewels. Although, interestingly, a lot of the, the jewels, uh, a lot of the gemstones in the crown jewels have been replaced over the years. So sometimes they put um, simulated imitation artificial gems in there. Sometimes the gemstones were originally not what people thought they were. So there's a number of sapphire or things that look like sapphires in there that are actually like foil back stones, quartzes, etc. But over the years, when, they, when, when monarchs and things get poor and they want to invade because in, in, in England we'd like to invade lots of places constantly throughout history but you need money if you're going to do that and so a lot of the time they would they would pawn the jewels and things like that or maybe sell some of the some of the stones and they would often sometimes lend or borrow stones to put in the crown so they're not always all diamonds rubies and sapphires and things like that in there so then the difference with the coronet is that it doesn't have arches and it still has symbolism. It is to show that you are a peer of the realm. So you're a duke, you're a duchess, you're a, you're a marchioness, or what are those sorts of things. But they do have a lot of symbolism. And what you'll see is, is the different coronets will, will, di will, will show. And so it's something that you can have on your head and so people can see from afar how important you are. Because the different symbols or the different um, types of the coronet will show you, you know, whether, whether you're a duke, whether you're a duchess, etc. And so then... Uh, to sort of like summarise the headgear stuff, we've got tiara, which is just a fancy pants head ornament that anyone can wear, doesn't have any symbolism. A diadem should be something that's a complete circle, something that traditionally would be tied around the head to show sta uh, status or power. A crown is only to be used for a king or queen, and it will have arches. And a coronet is for other peers, but doesn't have arches. So then looking at my, my argument, the main difference between a crown that tells you whether you are a king or a coronet that tells you whether you are a duke is golden arches. <laughs> so, I think what we have is we do not have Burger King, we have Burger Duke and we have King McDonald because they're the only ones that have the golden arches. Um, and then moving on to my second argument, this is one that I had with my father. He once, once one day just said, like in an offhand comment, something or other about a king's crown or a queen's crown. I went, what are you talking about? Is there such thing as a king's crown or a queen's crown? They're the same thing. And there are some crowns that are made for specific people, so it's been made for a king or it's been made for a queen. But certainly with the, with, with our, uh, with the UK crown jewels, there is no such thing as a king's crown or a queen's crown. It's the same crown. And this is what I was arguing with him. He, he has a reason why he said that, but he is, he's, he's wrong. There isn't a king's crown or a queen's crown. So this on the, the right is St. Edward's crown, which is, a, is, a, is the crown that the king or queen is crowned with during the coronation. And then they swap it afterwards for this crown here. And so they do get altered. But they're, they're the same crown. So here you've got um, Queen Elizabeth II wearing the um, imperial state crown and her father wearing the imperial state crown. And it's just been a little bit lowered for her. That's all they've done is they've made the arches a bit smaller. But it's not a king's crown or a queen's crown. It's exactly the same crown. They just make them a bit smaller or they change them a little bit. Uh, this was when um, the Duke of Argyle was, <laughs> was carrying, I don't think it was this crown, I, I, I forget which one it was, um, he was carrying uh, the crown on a cushion and he dropped it during something and it got completely squished and had to be completely remade. Uh, Queen Victoria said it been, looked like a, a squashed pudding after he'd wrecked it. But there's a, a number of the crowns have been remade over the years. So the, um, the St. Edward's crown actually was, was melted when we decided that we were just going to overthrow the king and we didn't want that anymore. So they just melted it down so then they had to make a whole new one for, for King Charles the, se uh, the second, I think. Uh, but this one, this is, this is a crown that was, these are two crowns that were made for queens and they are quite feminine. Uh, but just another way that we can see that we do sometimes change them. So this is, um, which one is this one? I've 
want to make sure I'm getting it right for you. So the one on the left is the Queen Mother's crown, and then the one on the right is Queen Mary's crown. And so this is the crown that um, Camilla wore when she was when she was crowned queen, and she is queen. Uh, there was a lot of arguments about whether she should be or shouldn't be, and there was a load of like everyone had an opinion on it. But uh, she is the queen. She's the queen consort. But they did uh, Garrard did alter this for her. So they've taken off four of the arches. Um, this here um, is is a, is a replica of one of the Cullinan diamonds, and then they've put uh, Cullinan four, five, and six, I think it is, or it's five, six, and seven, back in the crown. So these were three diamonds that the Queen used to wear in a brooch, and um, that she used to call Granny's Chips. <laughs> they are absolutely ginormous diamonds. But those were remounted into the crown for Camilla, and a, and a couple of arches were taken off for her. So this is what my father was talking about. He's talking about um, the representation of the crown, not the crown itself. So what you have is something which is called a cipher. And so every monarch has their own cipher, which is a representation of, of the crown. So my father was in the Navy and he said, no, no, you definitely had kings and queens crowns because I remember my father had to have new uniform when the, when the, when the, when the queen came in. And that's what he's talking about. So each monarch will have their own. So this is King George's where you've got these, this monogram and this symbol of the crown. Uh, and that is the Tudor crown there, and then Queen Elizabeth's, where she's got her um, cipher there, and then hers, which is the uh, St Edward's crown. So that's what he's talking about. So each of the monarchs will have this, and so this is King Charles. So it, it started with Henry VIII, and he added an R to mean Rex, to mean King. So it's their initials, and then their regnal number, so what number King or Queen they are. So this is uh, King Charles III, and he has the Tudor crown above his, and then that one for Elizabeth. What's quite interesting is if you listen to um, Justin's talk, uh, these probably wouldn't have been original if these are faceted gemstones, because when this crown was first made, we didn't have faceted gemstones, and it's quite interesting, that sort of thing. Another time where you see a crown that is completely wrong, another one that annoys me, is in the Disney film Robin Hood. King John's crown has got faceted gemstones in it, and it wouldn't have had faceted gemstones at the time, so Disney obviously didn't do their research very well. What we do see is that we, um, this is actually the uh, King Charles's cipher in Scotland, and it has the Scottish crown above it. So whilst we don't have king, uh, king's crowns and queen's crowns, we do have English and Scottish crowns. And Scottish people are very, very patriotic, and they, they like their own things, and so we make sure that we, we give them their own crown up in Scotland. But it's quite useful, it's quite interesting, these ciphers. It's something that, that lots of people collect these things, um, but what you can do is anything that has the, the monarch cipher on there will change when we have a new monarch. And so things like post boxes, telephone boxes, stamps, military uniforms will all have these on there. So you can, you can go around and you can sort of date post boxes and things from, from which cipher has on there. So this one is Queen Victoria's. This is George, Ooh, not sure which one. One of the Georges, this is Queen Elizabeth, and this one is Edward VIII, and that's the most rare one because he was only the monarch for um, 300 and something days, I think it was. Let me just check that for you. So he was the shortest, um, 325 days he was, he was the monarch for, and he actually abdicated because he wanted to marry Wallace Simpson, who was, who was divorced, which is also why there was all that hoo-ha over Camilla, because she'd been divorced as well. And it was like, well, he had to, he had to abdicate. Why does he get to have somebody who was divorced? Um, but so he was, he was only uh, the monarch for 325 days. There's only 271 of these post boxes. So you can, like, you can find a list of where they are, and you can go and see them. So if you ever see one of those in the UK, that one's an incredibly rare one. But there's, there's absolutely loads of uh, Queen Elizabeth post boxes. I don't think um, we've had any post boxes put up for King Charles just yet. And then into the final bit, like how to wear a tiara or how to keep a tiara on, essentially. Um, I took a bit of artistic license with this because that's get it on rather than keep it on, but you know, a bit of T-Rex, that's a quite a good thing. So there's a load of rules, like etiquette rules in, in well, with everything, everything you can possibly think of in England, we have a rule that, you, that you're supposed to do certain things. And there's lots of rules about tiara wearing, which I think mostly are completely nonsense. Um, but it's quite interesting. So if you look at old paintings and things, you can sometimes see ladies going to court. Uh, so going to um, the palace for balls and things. Um, and so if the lady is wearing a tiara, it indicates that she is married. Unmarried women are not allowed to wear tiaras. I am not married. I am resolutely not married. Mr. Andrew Lawrence is very bad at being married. He's already been married twice, so I'm not going to marry him. Um, but but I, 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 I just disregard this rule. I'm going to wear one anyway. But this is the reason why when we get married, we have a veil. 
because the veil covers the tiara whilst you are unmarried. Um, it's also because traditionally the act of marriage was one man giving a woman to somebody else. Um, and it was a contract, so the woman was usually being sold to somebody, and what they wanted was they wanted the new bloke to accept this woman before they saw her, just in case she was a bit of a dog. Um, so that's why they have a veil on, because you, you sign the contract, you then unveil the woman, and it's a bit tough if you've got an ugly wife at that point. Uh, but it also un, un, unveils your tiara as well. So the other one is um, they're supposed to only be worn with white tie. So this is sort of like the highest dress code in the UK. Uh, so if it was a black tie function, you wouldn't be wearing a tiara, but if it's, if it's a white tie function, you would. Again, rubbish. I regularly wear mine to, like, Walmart or something like that. So um, if it's on the invite, so this is something that I think I probably am going to adopt this rule. I think I'm, I want, this is what I, this is what I mean about me, me what, I want these, like, lovely engraved invitations for my birthday party. And I will insist that people wear tiaras to my parties in the future. So this is probably about the only rule that I am going to adopt. But again, it's, on, it's, it's, it's etiquette. So if you're, if you're sending invites, you're going to tell people on there what the dress code is and what they should or shouldn't be wearing. Um, not before you're 18. I just think that's rubbish. When you see little girls in tiaras, it's really cute. I don't see why you need to wait, quite frankly. Um, don't buy your own. You're not supposed to buy your own tiara. And also, there's this whole thing about you shouldn't buy a tiara. Know, where did they come from in the first place? Then Someone had to have bought it at some point. But you're supposed to be gifted a tiara. And so a lot of the time, you would have been gifted a tiara on your 18th birthday. Sometimes it would have been a family tiara. Or it might be one that was commissioned for you. And a lot of these things, because they would be expensive, jewels would be remodeled from other things. Or maybe you take granny's jewelry, you pull it apart, and you turn it into a tiara. And sometimes they're also loaned. So particularly in the royal family, the Queen would lend a tiara to certain people. So for instance, Kate Middleton has a number of tiaras that were loaned to her by the Queen. They're often lent for life. And so that's then your tiara and no one else gets to wear it. And don't wear a tiara at a hotel. I think this is just because, you know, people are a bit snobby in England. So it's like, oh, that's just a bit common, wearing a, wearing a tiara at a hotel. Again, total nonsense. Not before 5 p.m. This is, another, this is not just tiaras, you're also not supposed to wear diamonds before 5pm um, because it's terribly common and crass. Um, but some of that will also come back to some of the things that you will have heard uh, Justin talking about. It's to do with lighting and things. That diamonds just didn't look very good in the daytime. What you wanted was candlelight for them to be flickering and looking beautiful, but also it's just a bit common to wear diamonds before 5 so then the things that I would suggest is, is, is choose a tiara that you can afford. Uh, and you can afford them. They're not all, you know, horribly expensive. This one, I think, is horribly expensive because this is a prop from a film. So it's just base metal and CZ. But it's still, you know, nearly $50,000. Um, or you can go and get something like this, you know, like the one that, that Gary had on earlier. You can get this, I think, was £3.99. So it's about $5. Um, I bought a load of these for, um, whilst I'm not married, what I did have was a not not wedding, uh, which is like a civil partnership in the UK. And so when we had our not wedding, I decorated the, 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 the tables where we had our lunch with rugby balls, because that's what Andrew's into, and tiaras. And so I bought about 40 tiaras so that everyone had the opportunity to wear one for their lunch. Uh, and then these, I think, I think this is excellent value for money. Actually, I think it's a beautiful piece of jewellery. It can be worn as a tiara, it can be worn as a necklace. And that's the other thing is there's a lot of them where they're adaptable. And so you can take them apart and use them as different things. So I think, you know, a beautiful tourmaline necklace as well as a, as, as a tiara. And so that's what you would have a lot of the time is you have these frames um, that the, 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 the necklace or the brooches or whatever get attached onto. A lot of the time they get screwed into those. So it then becomes a tiara. So ultimately, if you just get a frame and you stick some of your jewellery on it, you, you've got a tiara. Um, and so when I, when I, I was going to say when I grow up, but I don't think I'm going to do that. I think that's overrated. Um, but when I've just got loads of money and I don't need to worry about paying bills and I've just, I'm just, what was it someone said, it, what um, Alberta said, full of money? When I'm full of money, um, I'm just going to make tiaras, so, but I'm going to make them adaptable so that they're things that you can pull apart and you can wear in a number of different ways. Uh, so this one, I think this one is excellent value for money because it actually comes apart into 11 pieces. And so it's only £77,000 per piece. So that's, that's an absolute bargain, isn't it? That's the sort of thing that, that we women like to do is we like to justify something because we're like, because I'm going to use it loads. And so actually per use, yes, I know that this is a £700 pair of shoes, but I'm going to wear them all at the time. So therefore per use, they're, they're really, really cheap. You know, so that's with this tiara, you've got 11 separate things. And imagine all of the times and occasions you could wear that. I mean, it would be six Really not to buy it almost and then the other thing is just borrow them so um, this was um, my 
Christmas a few years ago where I provided tiaras for all of the female guests so that they, they could wear one. I also one year insisted that we watched Downton Abbey whilst wearing tiaras. Um, Andrew's mother was with us at the time um, and she, she was forced to wear a tiara and halfway through she started to take it off her head. I was like, do not take your tiara. She was like, but it's hurting my head. I've got a headache. I, I'm like, I don't care. You're not taking that tiara if you're to sit there in pain. Um, but the, when I talk about manufacture of tiaras in a second, you'll see how you can get over that. The reason why her head was hurting is because the tiara wasn't made very well. Um, this is me in Tucson a few years ago. Um, I worked for CW Sellers on their stand, um, and Chris had made some replicas of the uh, Duchess of Devonshire's tiaras. So these were exact replicas of her tiaras. So um, again, not crowns. Um, I suppose you could cast it as a bit of a coronet, but it's not, because it's not specifically for that purpose. But she was a duchess, so she would have been able to wear them. Um, I borrowed this, and this was me at the Gem A Big Bash. And then we went to downtown Tucson afterwards. Um, I'd forgotten that I was wearing the tiara, so I'm just walking through Tucson in quite a rough bit of town, actually. I'm like, why is everyone looking at me really funnily? And it's because I'm wandering through Tucson wearing a, a tiara. This is one of my favourites. Um, this is the actual tiara from Downton Abbey, from Lady Mary's wedding. Um, and that's me and Bentley and Skinner in London wearing it. So that's why I've got that ridiculous, stupid grin on my face. So I was just like so excited to wear this famous piece of jewellery. Oh, well, you can make one. So I think this is really cool. Someone did um, an estimate of what it would cost you if you wanted to make uh, a copy of St Edward's Crown. So they've done everything. They've priced every single thing up, including a bit of velvet to make it. And so if you wanted to make St Edward's Crown, it will cost you probably about $4 million. So £3,658,000 to make one of those. But the appraisers in the room know that that's not what the crown is worth. That would be looking at it as a um, cost model where you're, you're costing it out. Um, but actually, I don't think that you would do that. And Deborah would tell us that what we would want to do is find some comparables for this. Um, so if you go online and you Google crowns, uh, you'll obviously find loads of those for sale. So you'll be able to value it very, very easily. But no, the value of that far exceeds the components. Um, it's obviously got provenance and all of those other things. So I don't know who gets to value the crown jewels. Shirley, is that your job? Do you do that one or is that somebody else? Does Bucky do it? He gets all the big jobs, doesn't he, the bugger? Um, but yeah, I just think that's quite interesting that someone has sat down and they've done that. But it also shows the difference between price, value and different uh, valuation method methodologies. Uh, you can, of course, get one custom made. Um, I really like tiaras, so I make people design them for me for fun. So this is a competition that we ran um, last year, and we had a child, we had a young child's category, a medium child category, and an adult category. And this was actually designed by my friend Leona Fish, and this was the one that won ultimately. And I just love it because this, uh, like a lot of crowns, coronets, tiaras, etc., there's just so much symbolism in there. She knows that I'm a real gemology nerd. So um, on the the, the left hand side is waves. To, to represent waves of light, and on this side is a spectrum. Um, in, in the middle is one of each of the seven crystal systems, and then there is a cut gemstone in all of the seven colours of the rainbow. Um, this is, I think this is Morse code, and I can't remember what it's for. Um, and then this one is a symbol of wisdom, because she says that I'm very wise. I mean, she knows me very well, but I don't know why she thinks I'm very wise, but that's what that, what that is. And so I haven't had this made yet. Leona's actually not a maker. Um, but I would like to get it made. So if anybody wants to make me this tiara, please do, do, do let me know. Uh, and then you do need to plan um, wearing a tiara. Mostly what I do is I decide what tiara I'm going to wear. Um, and then I plan my outfit around it. I regularly wear this one. This is one of my favourite ones. This is the Coldwell Steel tiara. This was um, gifted to me by Sarah and David because they, we all went on holiday together. Um, and they found this in an antique shop. And what they said was, oh, we'd better buy that for Kerry because when she has a little bit of a paddy, we can give it to her and calm her down. Um, and what happened is that they'd been with us for about three minutes. And so they, it happened a lot, lot quicker than they thought. And I had a little bit of a toddler tantrum. And they were like, quick, quick, get the emergency gift. And they brought this out. And it is absolutely, I think it's just absolutely beautiful. Um, and it goes to show that you don't need to have Precious, I mean, I'm sure it probably is 24 karat gold, isn't it, Sarah, with Colombian emeralds? Um, but minor oil. Yeah, oh, minor oil, yeah, only minor oil in these ones. But you don't have to have precious metals and precious gemstones to have a glorious object. But you do need to plan it, because this is another time I wore a tiara with um, Sarah. Um, and again, there was a slight toddler meltdown, wasn't there? Because this was Sarah trying to get the tiara into my head before um, a party. She was 
jabbing pins into me and pulling my hair and shouting at me for fidgeting um, because I hadn't planned how I was going to keep this tiara on my head and it just it just wouldn't stay. Um, it, we probably, I don't know boys, how long was it? About 45 minutes trying to get this bloody tiara on um, and by the end of it I was just, I was dripping with blood where she'd stabbed me with pins and, and all sorts of things and bruises where she'd slapped me because I was fidgeting. Um, but some, some good advice is do not wash your hair. And this is also this this is also true. I'm also a qualified hairdresser, weirdly. I'm a bit like Justin, where I just randomly pick up hobbies and things and just you know have a crack at something. So um, but this is the same as if you want to put your hair up, you shouldn't have freshly washed hair because it's too slippery. So you shouldn't wash your hair because what you also want to do is make sure that you've got a good firm base. And so what you ideally want you to do is, is back comb the absolute living hell out of your hair, fill it with, with hair hairspray so you've created like a little nest. To, to jab those pins into for your tiara. Um, and also give it a base. So this one here, and I've forgotten which, which, which very, very important royal this is. But what she's done is she's actually created a little plait there, which then the tiara can rest along where you can pin it into. Um, but you definitely want something. This is it. Um, traditional tiaras often are raised up. All of the ones that I've got here. The tiara is directly onto the band, but usually, because you've got quite a fancy pants hairstyle, they're usually raised up a little bit. So you want to make sure that if you have got one of those, that you've done a good bit of back combing there, because you don't want to see this ugly bit at the bottom. So you need to think about how you're going to do your hair. Uh, but you can actually sew them in. So these ones here, this one, this has actually been sewn in to her hair. So again, she's got lovely dirty hair that someone has just wrecked by back combing to death. Um, and sewn it in, and the same here with Princess Diana's one. And this velvet band is really, really important as well because what you need is you need the velvet to tie in. This goes very well with her hair, matches very nicely, so it sort of camouflages it. But also, velvet is very grippy, and so the velvet itself will kind of like grip onto your hair and keep it there. Um, and uh, there's only one woman apparently now in London who knows the traditional techniques of doing the velvet band on a tiara. Uh, fortunately, she's a friend of mine's mother, so she can do all of mine. Um, and then make sure that you're using hardware. I, I wouldn't recommend hammering pins into your head, like uh, Sarah did to me. It's quite painful. Um, but there's a number of different things that you can do. This is my favourite method. If you've got hair, I mean, if you've got short hair, you've got to think about that because you haven't got much hair to pin it into, and you probably don't want a, a dirty, great strap around the back of your head. It kind of ruins your fancy pants outfit a little bit. Um, but these are really useful. Most of them do have these little holes on the ends and people often think that that's for putting a pin in it's not it's for attaching tiara elastic and that's a really good way you put it on and then it just sort of like holds on to your head um this one they've actually sewn in a hair comb there i'm not sure i like that so much because you've got quite a lot of gaps there in front of those pearls and i think you'd probably see that comb so i don't like that as a solution but if you've got a, a, a tiara that's maybe a little bit more closed in um, and then the traditional just pinning it in like that um, this one, the shoehorn is there because I've literally just shoehorned this in because I just think it's really cool. It doesn't go with anything else in the talk. Um, but again, if you get to go to London, do go to the V&A. They have an amazing jewellery and gemstone gallery. What's really interesting, my friend Joe Warley, who used to be the creator there, told me um, that you need to jump when you get to the tiaras. And the reason for that is um, a couple of the tiaras, this one included, are mounted on tremblant. And so what that means is that the, the, the pieces are on little springs. So if you stand there, I'm not going to do it because I'll probably go through this stage if I, if I did a jump. But you jump and then all of the tiaras just like wobble and glitter at you. You look like an absolute lunatic, um, but it's worth it for the, for the shimmer that you get. Um, and then the other thing is, is just to do it. I don't know whether this has got sound or not, or whether I just put a video on. But this was one of those days where I was really grumpy when I woke up and I just decided. Um, why am I wearing a tiara? I'm wearing a tiara because I was very, very grumpy and angry. And I thought, how am I going to cheer myself up? And wearing a tiara always cheers me up. And I did get a little bit cheered up because as I walked into the office, the girl who works here went, oh, you look absolutely lovely today. She was also looking at me like I'm a bit mental. Um, I am wearing lots of blue eyeliner, a tiara and a fluffy blue coat. So... Yeah, I mean, I, I look a little mental, but it has taken me up dressing like a ridiculous person. But that, that's what I would suggest, is, is do have a tiara and do put it on to, uh, to cheer yourself up. Um, so yeah, so my thank yous, because that's it for me. Um, I can't even remember what I've done. I've put SGA, because it's the wrong one. I've repurposed this. Sorry, Gary. How embarrassing. Thank you, American Gem Society, for sponsoring these talks. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, HTA, for having me here. 
Um, Jeffrey Munn, who is an amazing man, he's on the Antiques Roadshow, and he's just a glorious, glorious human. Um, and I used a lot of his work while I was researching this, and also I just love him and reading about tiaras from him. Yeah, all of the people on the internet whose work I have shamelessly plundered to use for this, all of you for listening to me. Um, Tori Lopez, who is on the Barker & Co stand downstairs, she works with me. Um, she keeps me saying she makes me salad, not sad salad, in, in, in work. And Mr Andrew Lawrence for putting up with me. Um, and if you want to know what the 6am willy picture is, you should probably ask me later. Thank you very much. Um, okay, it's a, it's a, you probably know, it's not a ruby, it's a red spinel, it's a Mughal gem, it's actually a bead, if you have a look at that in the crown, you can actually see that it's drilled all the way through, it's quite large, it's probably about this big, so let's say a free form tumbled red spinel, it probably weighs, I don't know, 250 carats, so red spinels are quite expensive, Probably that sort of colour, you're probably looking at about $2,000 a carat, so maybe $300,000 if you wanted to go and buy one from somebody. One. Yeah, we all do. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, I would I would just have in very, very big, bold capitals at the bottom, you must wear a tiara. Just, just, I mean, I'd be really clear about it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be subtle. I wouldn't put a dress code. I would just literally, and I would, and I would probably call each one of them individually and go, what tiara are you bringing? Do you need me to lend you one? But I would be very, very, it would be, it would be definite, you know, big letters, make sure you wear a tiara. And I would probably insist on some sort of, sorry? Yeah, exactly. Wear whatever you want. Come in jeans, but you have to wear a tiara. And I would insist on men wearing fancy jewellery as well, because I think that's quite, that's quite nice. Yes. I think they tend to alternate, to be honest. I don't know whether they, whether they choose their own, but it, for the past few years, certainly, that it's just alternated between the two. It's the Tudor crown, then it's St. Edward's crown. Uh, but I, it, it tends to look quite similar. Sometimes the, the, like the representation of that crown is slightly different in style, um, but they are, they are remarkably similar. Sarah. Um, I got my tiara for a couple of hours last night, um, mm. and um, it gave me crippling toothache. I'm just wondering if, if you can advise how to avoid oh. that. Do you know what? Um, I didn't look at, I mean, I'm not surprised that you got toothache because, you know, you are, that's, that's exactly the sort of thing that would happen to you, isn't it? Sarah, on a reg Sarah nearly dies at least twice a week from some sort of weird injury. Um, so the two things I was going to say, and I actually didn't say this about designing tiaras, is you do need to think about it. So that's, that's why, the reason why you have a crippling head, well, most people have a crippling headache, you've got toothache, randomly. Um, it's because people, when they make tiaras, they don't make them right. This is one of mine from a designer called Fei Lu in the UK. And I have actually spoke, he's a friend of mine, and I did tell him that this is a terrible design and he needs to redo it. Um, because if you can have a look at this tiara, it sits straight up. That's completely wrong. They should be slanted forward like that because when you put them on your head, they're then sitting in the right location. You don't sit it on your head like that. It goes backwards a little bit. Um, and the other thing is, is people's heads are not circular. People's heads are ovoid. Um, and so this is about the only one that's a sensible shape for a head. All of the others tend to be circular, and that's why you get a headache, because it goes around like that, and it's not like clamps and sticks into your skull. Um, and so then you, you tend to, I tend to bend them. So I've bent this a number of times. This was actually sterling silver, and so it's completely bent now. And that's, that's the reason why. So I would suggest making sure that if you're having one made, you get it made the right shape for your head. And if you're going to the expense of having one made, just get someone to like, I don't know, take a mould of your head or something um, and do that. But if not, bend it so that you, you bend them out slightly so that it becomes a little bit more ovoid rather than round. That would be my suggestion. I don't know why you've got toothaches there. You're just weird. I would imagine so because um, since Henry VIII, 
uh, the monarch is also the head of the Church of England. So it's also they're also, as well as being the king or queen, they're the head of the church in the UK as well. So there does need to be some religious element to that. But traditionally, kings and queens were always quite religious, weren't they? Um, and the church is quite rich, so it was good for them to keep in touch with them and that sort of thing. Um, so there has always been religious symbolism in line with crown jewels and things like that. So I don't know whether there's a requirement for it, um, but you're quite right, they do all have crosses on them in, in some way, shape or form. Any other questions? It's not a question, you're just so <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You can hang around. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.